It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. John, Thank thanks. you for it's giving us here. the time. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I think one of the questions that's on people's minds, at the top of their minds, is where you might locate your headquarters. And I believe you announced that earlier today. So maybe that's something we can reveal. Yeah, no, we time. announced uh, a location in the seaport, uh, the, right by uh, the old Gillette building, two existing buildings. And we'll build on two and a half acres right there in the seaport. Uh, we'll be there by this summer in temporary, uh, uh, temporary housing. So August 22nd, we'll have a couple hundred people here. Uh, we plan to have uh, about 200 people from corporate and about 800 people in labs around there. And we think by the time it's all said and done, there should be, you know, let's say 4,000 jobs around the ecosystem in Boston. So uh, we're excited to be here. We think it's. Uh, it's a good, it's a good location. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a building right there on the channel, right in the seaport. It's gonna be, uh, you know, we want you to be proud of it. We're certainly proud to be here, and it's gonna have, uh, I, I think, a G logo that's about 20 stories high, something like that. <laughs> that was, that was part of, that was the most important part of the deal. So, and we really want you to be, we want you to be, uh, we want you to be proud of us, we're proud, we're proud to be here. So That's great. We're, we're are, excited. We are definitely very proud and excited to have you here. So, so GE is really famous for people management, leadership development is one of the key sort of underpinnings of the success of GE. So now you're in Boston, um, how will you judge Boston as an ecosystem and community and contributor to the GE family and what do we have to do to be in the top 20% uh, uh, contributors as a city as you look out across the world? So look, I, I mean, I think as we went through the process, uh, first I'd say it's a, it's a two-way street, all right? So first, here's, I think, what we can uh, do for you. Uh, clearly, the economics, the jobs, things like that, you know, the, the, I always tell people the most important thing any company can bring is competitive spirit. You know, we want to win. We, we win. And we want to bring that competitive spirit for what we do. So we want to bring that. Uh, our people are, gee, a working person's company. Our people give back to the community. They know what it means to go to public high schools. They know what it means to volunteer in hospitals and things like that. So I think you'll find us a, a generous neighbor in town. So I think those are the things uh, we can bring to the city. Now, the schools and the startup ecosystem in Boston is amazing, right? Uh, more than 50 universities, lots of alums from the universities are, are with GE. I would say the historic startup culture is astounding. Uh, in some industries, the town does extremely well. And we want to be part of this ecosystem of universities and scholarship and in this sea of ideas. But. 20% uh, of the S&P 500, as we sit here today, is from consumer internet companies that are less than 20 years old. And they are in San Francisco and Seattle. And almost all of their leaders went to MIT and places like that, right? So my thought is that there might be a chance to be a good convener here. The next generation, if you look at 10 or 15 or 20 years, Probably 20% of the S&P 500 is going to be the merger of data and physics. This is a real amazing, it's called, you know, there's buzzwords, industrial internet and things like that, but it's real. This is going to happen. And if Boston isn't the headquarters of that flow, uh, shame on both of us. It'll mean that GE hasn't done what we think we can do. It'll mean that the town hasn't done what it can do. So you got another whole wave coming at us in terms of technology and change is equal to or bigger than the consumer internet was 20 years ago. And Boston needs to get more than its fair share. And that's kind of what we're betting on. Yeah. We're betting on our ability to kind of be part of that as it evolves. And, and really, in the Boston setting, you bring, uh, this was the genesis in this country of a lot of big iron, which we're very comfortable with. But it also has to be equally good at the big data analytics. And there's no reason why Boston can't be that city for the next 20 years, the way Silicon Valley and Seattle were for the last 20 years. And that's our job, to do that together. Amen. And that's our bet. That's, that's our bet. Our bet is that 
we want to win in that space, right? We, we, we don't want this revolution to, to go forward and not have GE investors and GE people get the most out of that. And I would say in life sciences, Boston can lay claim to being either the best or among the best in the world, clearly. But there's more to come, and our bet is that we can be part of that. And, and working with the universities, working with the great science and education schools here, make it happen in this town. Awesome. So you guys are so large and so diverse and with expertise in so many different areas. How do you work with outside partners, like startups in particular that are much smaller and lack, like have excellence in certain areas that maybe have amazing innovative technology but lack a lot of the other functionality that might surround a So you know, John, I think it's really hard. You know, I, I think every, almost every big company has a ventures um, group. But it's, it's, it's so hard to make sure that we bring our best and don't end up squashing the company inside our own bureaucracies and things like that. I mean, I'd love to say G is a perfect company, but we're not. And so the trick is to find the win-win. Uh, we've had a couple of starts at it. We actually have gone out and hired uh, uh, a woman from a venture capitalist who uh, runs our operation, headquartered in uh, California, California, but we have people all over the world. And I think the trick is to do exactly what you're doing here in Boston, which is we don't take an equity stake in a company that doesn't have a sign to it, accelerators, how do you get your first order, how do you make things, you know, the things that really, if you're starting up a company you really need, we have to be able to deliver on that. So we've got much more discipline about, first of all, how do they fit on our own, let's say, product and technical roadmap and differentiating between when we take an investment in a company and, and we think it's gonna fit long term with what G's doing. And sometimes we take investments in a company because we just think it's a good idea and it's gonna make money. And I'd say 70% is the former, 30% is the latter. But then the day, you, the day we take a stake, you're assigned a GE team that's really there to help you navigate to get the best out of what we yeah. can bring. And that's, I think that's a change that's been an important change. Well, you guys have such a large footprint, and again, super diverse, aviation, healthcare, um, you know, massive breadth of industries and expertise. So how do you foster unity and collaboration inside that massive organization, and to what extent can we learn in Boston uh, to be part of that collaborative environment, even as an extension of the organization outside of your walls? So look, I, I mean, I, I would say we, we have what we call the G store, which is really a couple core processes we do across the company. So we really want our healthcare team to be great in healthcare. We want our aviation team to be great in aviation. We want our power team. We want them to compete against either conglomerates or single point companies that they work with. But then we drive technology. We drive globalization. We drive how we interface with the customers. We drive culture across uh, uh, the company in a more unified way. And if you're an investor, you sit there and say, look, by doing that, are our margins and returns better than our competitors? If the answer is yes, we've earned the right to say our business model works. And when the answer is no, you shouldn't stay in the business. You know, my contribution to NBC was make better shows, right? It wasn't go, go to the research lab or help you in China or something like that. It's, hey guys, please don't make shows that stink that badly. Let's do better, let's do better. <laughs> So NBC belongs someplace else. It didn't belong inside, inside GE. And we're pretty philosophical about the things we do best and making sure uh, we do it. Now, part of our culture is a belief that markets rule. And part of a belief that markets rule, customer, you know, the number one GE belief is customers determine our success. And if you really believe that, you have to be open to any new idea. You have to be open to technology. We're not going to invent it all inside our company. And so we have to be a place where people want to come and work with us uh, to develop the future. Now, the advantage we have that venture, you know, again, I'm, I'm here today as just friends talking, right? Uh, the advantage we have that venture capital firms don't have is we've seen cycles, you know, we manage through cycles. You know, our, some of our businesses right now are going through a tough cycle, but we have other businesses that uh, make up for that. Uh, Bob said, I, I took over after 9-11. Let me tell you, there was no business on earth that was worse than the commercial aviation business. At that moment in time, we had 50% market share of jet engines, and we owned 1,200 aircraft, and there was no place to hide. And that business stunk for three or four years. Now that business has a $175 billion backlog. Investors quite like it today. 
right? In 2003 or 2004, they'd say, why do you have, own so many aircraft? You say, because I do, we do, you know? We have to work through the cycle. So the thing we bring is, if you're a venture capitalist, you, if two companies work and eight don't work, that's good. If you're a company, you're willing to spend time and work through a down cycle. And that's okay. That's a strength we bring that maybe, you know, that we both have a room in the world. There's a, venture capitalists are awesome. They do great things. But managing through cycles is something we, we can bring culturally that it's harder for sometimes startup companies yeah, to yeah, see absolutely. their way through. So uh, you have much longer t uh, time frame to, to play it all out, which is great. And then the diversity of businesses to learn lessons from is awesome. So how do you, so a lot of times I'll think about business, you have either you can grow the pie, right? You can increase the num the size of the market, and then if you've got a slice of that, then it automatically gets bigger. Or you can fight over market share within the existing market. How do you think about sort of the value creation piece of things? I see there it being awesome opportunity across the globe. A lot of people that are not really part of the global economy right now that we can integrate more and give opportunity um, so globally, but also within our own communities here. How do we integrate more people into the economy, into the system, and create more value for everybody? You know, John, I, I'd say I'd make two just general comments that impact almost everybody here. You know, the first one is um, uh, kind of slow growth world, right? So you're, you're going to live in a world where the U.S. is okay. Uh, the rest of the world has kind of been more or less, I'd say, perverted by uh, central banks, uh, you know, manipulating currency and flooding capital. So there's, in, in, be, there's been no, essentially no reform anywhere in the world. And so the central bankers have taken the place of what historically governments have done. So you've got decent growth, but not robust growth in the U.S. You've got kind of central bank uh, difficulty every place else. You've got China in transition and populism. So you've got four general things going on, all of which add up to kind of slow growth and volatility. So if you're, if you're waiting for the next puff of tailwind, your boat's going to be in the stuck for a long time. You know, there's just no kind of, you know, it's not that things are terrible. It's not like it was in 2008 in the financial crisis, but it's just, there's just not the general uh, view of uh, tailwinds, economic cycles. You know, sometimes I'll go see an investor and they'll say, what do you think about the economic cycle? And I say, kind of what cycle? We're at negative interest rates in Europe, right? You're at negative interest rates in Japan. Currencies are fluctuating plus or minus 7% in a month. The, the, the classic cycle's been thrown out the window. And the second thing I'd say is everything today is about productivity. Everything today is about speed and productivity. So anything we can do to bring more productivity to our customers or to our suppliers is great. So I would say just as a, as a general thought in terms of how we think about it, it's really our, our focus is on uh, adding more value through uh, digital and analytics with our customers and creating more value in our supply chain. So we're basically not necessarily focused on making the company broader, we're focused on making the company deeper. Mm. And that's the way we view generating growth in the future. And then I just think you're gonna have to go, uh, you're gonna have to do more OPEX models and fewer CAPEX models, right? To your point, there's a lot of ways to grow you know, maybe with people that don't have electricity or things like that, but you gotta bring financing solutions at the same time you're bringing products today. And if you can, if you can drive productivity, if you can create solutions, if you can be deeper, that's how, that's how we grow. So, you know, our, we're a $130 billion industrial company. We like to grow the company 5% organically. Five doesn't sound that lot, but on a $130 billion base, that ain't bad. That's, that's some real, that's some real numbers here, so. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's great. Yeah. So I want to uh, open up for questions in just a few minutes. So start prepping them and get ready uh, for that. In the meantime, uh, Boston's a pretty big sports town. You got any? Uh, you a fan of any uh, any teams he here elsewhere? What's your? So um, so I, I met Robert at this luncheon in 2002, and at that time we owned NBC, and NBC had just punched out of all the NFL contracts. And Bob came up, I knew Bob a little bit, and he said, you know, hey Jeff, we'd love to get NBC uh, back in the NFL. And I said, hey Bob, look, we're, we're number one right now. You're too expensive. We can't afford the NFL right now. So two years later, we went from number one to number four. And I was begging Robert to get us back in the NFL. <laughs> I, was, I was begging Robert to get back in the NFL. So that was our strategy. <laughs> so, 
So that's how we ended up on Sunday night. That's how I got to know uh, uh, Bob. So I'm a big Patriots fan. I love the Patriots. Now, I was going to school in New Hampshire in 1975 when Bernie Carbo hit that damn home run. So I, I'm not in love with the Red Sox. So those are the two ends. It's gotten a lot better. Every place. It's gotten better. Red Sox have been great. So yeah. I've been, uh, but I'm a big, uh, I'm a big Bob Kraft fan, and I'm a big, uh, uh, I'm a big uh, Patriots fan. And you know, again, I'm a, I've been doing this long enough that I'm a student of culture and a student of leadership. And you see culture, right? When you see the, when you see the Patriots, and you see leadership when you see the Patriots. So I've had the chance to. No, Robert, and I grew up in Cincinnati, so they're better than the Bengals. So that's why I guess that's the, uh, those two things. Uh, those, I got those two things uh, going, going for me. Yeah. yeah, I thought when you were in your intro, when you were talking about uh, the culture of winning and wanting to win, um, I thought immediately of the Patriots and, and of Robert and his, his group that have done it. I would add to that, look, I would add to that uh, uh, Governor Baker and Mayor Walsh, right? So in, in other words, look, at the end of the day, you know, we all believe in transparency. There's been a lot written about uh, a lot written about how GE went about its process. What I would say is that uh, we're going to give back to the community. I, I just take my word for this. We're going to give back for any dollar that you think was invested in, in GE being here. And there are a lot of places we could have gone other than here. You will get back a thousandfold. Take my word for it. Just trust me on that. Okay. I, you, will, you will get back a thousand points. But the fact that you had a Republican governor and a Democratic mayor that actually could work together and actually thought, had a bigger vision for what this meant is unique, right? And both of them take crap because of it, probably, right? But that's actually, that's actually uh, uh, quite, a, quite a positive because, you know, we're 140 years old. We, we, we basically, upstate New York, New York City company that moved to Connecticut, this is a long-term investment for us. But what you're really investing in is the infrastructure of universities and a feeling about how people want to run their day-to-day -day life. And those are positives, really. That's, that's, that's stuff you can't quantify. And it's much more important than anything else. So that's yeah. positive. No, agreed. I think we have the most enlightened government in the, in the country. Uh, that ain't saying a lot right now, John. <laughs> yeah. But I'd say, <laughs> I'd say this is a, yeah. Fair enough, this is a pretty This is a pretty low bar here, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> but, but better than not being the most enlightened yeah, one, though, no, no. right? Which is, so we've, at least we got that. We've seen that, no, that's too. Good. That's yeah. good. No, they, they, both the governor and the mayor work very closely with Mass Challenge and with the whole community. Very collaborative, great people to work with. Yeah. Uh, really, I think you're going to be very, well, very, very welcome and very happy here. You made the right decision. I think Massachusetts is going through a renaissance period right now. There's awesome growth, amazing people, super collaborative. This is the best time. Yeah. It is the best place it, to be in the world right now is Massachusetts, and we're super happy to have you here. Uh, so thank you for that. Let me open it it's up. It's not for, quite number one yet, but you can be number one. <laughs> we can be number one. So um, let's open it up for questions. I think we have, are there mics being passed around? And we have one right here. Oh. Can you just stand up and say your name? Uh, I'm Joanne Simons. I'm uh, with the Northeast Arc. We support 7,000 people with disabilities in, the commu in uh, Massachusetts. And thank you to our governor for supporting the sector so uh, aggressively. But I have a hypothetical question. Suppose uh, my husband worked for GE for 29 years, eight months, and uh, 13 days. and. Um, he invested 99% of his 401k in GE Common Stock. I'd like you to comment on whether or not that's a, a good strategy. So I've done, I've never done anything but that. I think, uh, look, I think if you, if you want uh, consistent, valuable growth, good dividend, and I would actually say today diversification is a good thing. You know, conglomerates go in and out of favor, you know, in terms of how they're viewed by the market. I think they're actually coming back in favor just because the world's so volatile. Right? So I, I just think, you know, uh, uh, executing on the pivot from GE Capital has been important to our investors. And I'd say that's mainly behind us now. So uh, consistency, capital allocation, uh, whatever growth is out there, we're going to get. And, and uh, you're going to get a ticket to ride in what I would consider to be 
the most exciting growth uh, technology area of the next decade or so. And, I'm, and I put 100, 100%, tell your husband, I put 100% of every 401k in GE stock. I buy it in the open market. I've never sold a share, will never sell a share. So everything I have is, other than Boston real estate, is in GE stock. So, <laughs> so that's. Great. Other questions from the crowd? It's kind of quiet crowd today. Here we go, we have one up here, second table. Here it comes. There you go. Okay. All right. Hi, so, I'm Diane Darling. I'm over here in the corner. Great. Okay. Um, here, I'll pop over here. Um, if the governor of Connecticut asked for an exit interview, <laughs> what would you say when someone leaves and a situation like Connecticut has just gone through and maybe what Massachusetts should think about? What are some things that they did right? What are some things that they did wrong to, to retain you? Because obviously it's a, it's a loss for them. So, I mean, I'm not going to say anything bad about Connecticut. It was a great place to live. We've got a lot of friends there. I think uh, running, um, you know, running a, being a public servant today is a hard job, is a hard job. But I think for all of us, it's really about the future. It's about who's willing to fight for five or 10 years from now versus protecting the past. And that's true for companies, and it's true for governments. And if you're going to dwell on 100% of backward looking, it's, it's a hard world. And if you're willing to lean into those technologies, those changes, those collaborations, and that's what companies have to do today, and that's what governments have to do today. And it doesn't matter if you're in Connecticut or Massachusetts or Texas or Ohio, if you're looking backwards, uh, you're going to lose. And, I, and so I, I just, I, I, I can't say anything bad about the people because I think they work hard. And clearly we liked, uh, we liked our, uh, like the communities we live in. But this move for GE is all about the next 40 years. What do we want the company to look like? How do we want the company to be challenged? You know, I, I want people that are down in the seaport, I want them to walk out of their office every day and be terrified. I want them to be completely paranoid about the world that they're in, about are we moving fast enough, are, what can we do better, who's smarter than we are, and, and I want to be in this sea of ideas so that paranoia reigns supreme inside the company, right? <laughs> and and to, to look out the window and see, you know, deer running across, you know, that just, I don't care about that stuff. Right? <laughs> like, I want to like, I want some like 29 year old PhD student at MIT to punch me right in the nose and say, <laughs> all of GE's technologies are wrong, you're about to lose, right? And then you can go back and spread the word. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the job. That's, that's what we want, that's what we're looking forward to. And I just won't say, I don't want to say anything bad. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Go ahead. Uh, Jim Roosevelt from Tufts Health Plan. Uh, the, uh, we've got a presidential campaign, which at one point was entertaining and then maybe has become terrifying. Uh, and, but in each party, we've got a populist. Uh, one side calls it economic inequality. Another, the other side calls it uh, uh, the, middle, the middle class has been left out. What's the role of major corporate citizens like GE in changing that equation for the average American uh, and dealing with that anger that's out there? Look, I think it's a great, I think it's a great question. You know, I, I think, look, in my, in my career, if you don't work on innovation, productivity, and globalization, you get fired. I mean, I speak on behalf of every CEO in the room to say, if you don't work on innovation, productivity, globalization, you get fired. And if you're running for public office and, you, and you're for innovation, productivity, and globalization, you can't get elected. So our intersecting circles have moved further, further apart. Um, I think we need to be mindful and cognizant of the economic impact that we have. It doesn't mean, you know, look, 
I have to win in China, right? I have to compete. I have to, I have to make our engines cost less and those things. I have to. But at the same time, I think we have to bring our teams with us. We have to keep investing in training. We've got to give everybody that walks through the door a chance to compete from a tool standpoint. Uh, let me tell you, I was in uh, Hooksett, New Hampshire. Uh, with, uh, you know, just to, show you, just to show you how crazy I am, I was an early supporter of Lindsey Graham's, right? So, so I don't exactly pick them, right? Um, and I had Lindsey and Kelly Ayotte, we were doing a town hall, and these people, you know, the, the production associates that work there, um, they probably make sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. They have high-tech jobs. We've invested in the facility. It's winning. That's hard to do. That's great. I take great pride in that. And I don't need, really, I don't need any of the five people running for president. None of them know as much about factories as I do. None of them know much, as much about factory workers than I do. None of them have invested more in the competitiveness of this country than I have, than GE has. So I don't, I'm not really going to be lectured by these guys. Um, but we have to be cognizant of the role we create. We can't be callous about jobs. We can't be callous about the things we do, and we need to reinvest back into those core facilities that we think can be competitive for the longest, of which GE has many in the US. We're about a $20 billion exporter from the country. We're a net exporter to almost every country in the world, which means on a balance of trade basis, America's winning as GE exports around the world. Now, the last thing I, I would say is I was last week in Argentina and Brazil. Argentina is just leaving a populist government back to a more democratic one. It's a mess, and maybe this guy has a chance to turn it around. And Brazil's a place where a populist government has completely taken economic wealth and frittered it away. So if people in this country think that's the answer, look at some other places in terms of how, how it's done, in terms of what's out there. So I don't think business people have always done our best uh, we, we need to be accountable for the totality. But I would also say we need, uh, we need to be thoughtful about but what we're getting ready to do in the next six months in this country. Hi, my name is Suzanne Bump. I'm the State Auditor for the Commonwealth. Uh, I'm as delighted as, uh, as everybody else in this room because I'm in Boston five days a week that you're going to be here. But the other two days a week, I try to be at my home in the Berkshires where we have a lot of deer and moose and bear. But what we don't have is a lot of jobs. And you know well the, the legacy of, uh, of GE in, e in Pittsfield. And I'm not asking you about cleaning up the river. But I am asking whether you see whether you see that you just there... dropped that one out there just for <laughs> <laughs> just to say just to say welcome to Massachusetts, Gene. <laughs> say, frankly, I'm more sympathetic to your position than I am than that of some of my neighbors. I'm a little bit more of a realist. But my question for you really is, um, so what about the rest of the Commonwealth? You, there are great plans for, uh, and we are very excited about what you're going to do here in Boston, um, but the rest of the Commonwealth is not in the same boat as Boston. So you know, um, what I would say we've is got the, a lot um, of poverty. we've got 5,000 employees in Massachusetts in general, so we've got you know, quite, a good, quite a good position. Uh, We've got good relationships with the schools like WPI and Holy Cross and things like that. And I, I, look, I, I don't think this is the last investment that we make either in Boston or in the Commonwealth. I, I actually think that once we get up and going, there will be more, uh, more things that happen here. But I, you know, again, I, everybody has to do with the, so I guess my, my real, point to my answer is you'll see more of us around Massachusetts than just what we invested today. I think that's going to happen. Some will happen because we want it to. Something's going to happen naturally. I, I would expect more GE divisions to kind of think this is a good place to be. In terms of competitiveness, look, we're, we're a company, we believe in driving competitiveness, but the other places, the other people in this room, sometimes the burden's on you. The state and the communities have to be make it investable, have to, have to compete with other locations around, around the country. I, look, I, I, again, I would say this, I would say this, because uh, I, I, I've been with GE 34 years. I think, uh, I, I think uh, the governor and mayor have made a difference. That hasn't always been true here in the Commonwealth. 
there, there have been times when it hasn't been a very good place to do business. So, you know, I need to do my part, but it, every, look, everybody's going to have to compete for the future. There's no easy button for what any of us have to do. And that, that means the Berkshires. Great. I think Paul uh, Groen had a question. I don't know if he has a mic yet. Hi, Paul Grogan, uh, the Boston Foundation. Uh, GE has been very active charitably through the GE Foundation for some time. Be very interested in your approach to charitable giving and what some of your Boston priorities might be. So historically, we've, um, we've worked for decades on uh, inner city public education. So we've worked uh, for decades on uh, inner city schools and GE towns around the country. Uh, more recently, we've worked on community health as being a, uh, a great thrust for us. And I would say even more recently, we've uh, focused on what I would call employability. How do you help SMEs? How do you help, uh, how do you help train workers to maybe start their own companies or become better skilled for the 21st century? So I, look, I think, I think this is going to be, we like to do things where it's more than money, where we can bring our people, can bring their, uh, uh, their hard work, their intellect, their wanting to give back as well. So we try to stay in places that we actually bring some domain expertise. So you'll have hundreds of GE people that are mentoring in schools. You'll have GE technology or people that are working in health clinics everywhere in the world. And you'll, you'll, you'll be able to take, uh, we have a thing called a GE garage that we can take into communities that basically have modern manufacturing tools that we allow local entrepreneurs to play with, and, and you'll see all of that, all of that here. Look, I, I, again, I, I, we're going to talk more about this on April fourth, but we want to be part of this community. You know, we want big companies are complicated, right? Uh, there's going to be things about us that, from time to time, not everybody in here is going to like. But our job is to make sure the things you like are much higher than the things you don't like. So what I would say, there's, there's going to be a lot of things you're going to like about having GE in town. And our willingness to give back to uh, the community, both in terms of money, but more importantly, in terms of our teams, is going to be something that you're going to, I think you're going to be happy and satisfied with as time goes on. Thank you. Outstanding. That's great. I think we're coming up pretty close on our maybe one more question. We have time for just one more, if there's one out there. Sure. Same. <clears throat> Sorry, David Meeker, uh, Genzyme, Sanofi Genzyme. The, uh, the healthcare debate has gotten uh, pretty contentious and I would say distorted by the political process. GE is a major consumer and also a major provider in this space. Um, how does GE play in helping us get to a sustainable place here and, and what do you see that sustainable place being for the healthcare ecosystem? Oh, look, I mean, I think the, um, look, to your point, we're, we're a big in the industry. And we also are a legacy healthcare provider. So we've had employee healthcare since 1947. So in our best years, we earn more in our healthcare business than we pay in employee healthcare. It's about, you know, it's, it's a kind of, we see both sides of the, uh, the equation. Um, you know, I think the affordable, so the Affordable Care Act was at least an attempt. Uh, it certainly drives access. I think it's too early to say how the exchanges are going to work, but at least it was a try. Uh, it replaced really nothing, you know, so I think you have to give the president some credit for, for the attempt there. And then I always, I always break down healthcare into like four big systems problems. Consumers, you know, consumerism matters. So until people have some more accountability for their own healthcare cost, things don't change. So if you're like me and you go to a country like India, where everybody pays out of their own pocket for health care, you see different activity there than you see here. So something's got to change there. We have to drive innovation around chronic disease. So you know, as you know, that's a lot of the great work you guys do and so the work we do is how do you make you know, therapies for chronic disease more competitive? We have to do something about driving productivity into the system, right? It's, it still lacks 
a lot of the fundamentals on how do you drive quality up and take costs down. And we have to change the way people, you know, payment reform. You know, so those four things I always think about. And we play different places between our business and, uh, and our, our employee health. But uh, look, it's going to be 20% of the US GDP. It's growing every place. Everybody in this room, no matter what your business is, you're going to be a healthcare expert in the next 10 or 20 years, because this is not a problem uh, that's going away. So that's how we play. We play, uh, we play in a very complete way in terms of how we think about it. And we, we play in healthcare in 180 countries around the world as well. So that's, it's important to us. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. It's great for to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.